You know, snakes get a pretty bad rap. And so many times we persecute harmless snakes because we think they're venomous. Well, today we are going to show you exactly what the venomous snakes of Florida are. And I'm here with my good buddy David. How you doing, bud? Doing good. Ken. Yeah, I'm always getting him out of the office. He loves me. Anything to play with something dangerous. Exactly. Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to actually show you some of the venomous snakes here in Florida, but we're also going to show you why these animals here are so important for the environment. There are two things I've loved most in this life, bikes and reptiles. Now, I crisscross the globe learning about all kinds of incredible animals. Sometimes, I know what I'm doing. Other times, I'm in over okay, my head. Wrong. But one thing's for certain, we'll come away a whole lot smarter after every adventure. This is Camp Kennedy. So, all right, folks, we are here with the diminutive pygmy rattlesnake, okay? and. Um, David, you know, these animals are found all throughout Florida, correct? Yes, and this is probably Florida's most common venomous snake. Now, the thing to notice about them is look at this incredible uh, pattern on them. These animals will be found mostly in dry pine forests, and that's what that coloration comes into play for. But also, I don't know if you can hear it at home, but you can hear that little buzz. It is a true rattlesnake. They've got a rattle at the tip of their tail, but because of their size and the fact he's only got a few rattles, it is almost impossible to hear. And in order for you to really hear it, you'd have to put your head right up to it. And of course, we don't want to do that. No, that definitely snake. not. I can hear it just fine. And this is about as big as this snake will get. They really don't get much bigger. Uh, also, not to say, just like you said, you, know, you don't want to get bit by the snake, but if you are a full grown adult, this is not a lethal bite, is it? Uh, it is very, very rare to have a, a, a lethal bite from a pygmy rattlesnake. Okay. Um, here in the state of Florida, I don't know that there's ever been a reported death from a pygmy rattlesnake by itself. However, I have to comment that out of all the venomous snakes that we have, pygmy rattlesnakes are probably responsible for more bites to human beings than any of our other venomous snakes that we have within the state. And that's probably a good thing that the animal isn't so highly toxic and uh, this way, you know, we can get the anti-venom real quick. It's, it's definitely gonna make you very sick. So pay attention when in snake country, that's the best thing and that's what we're trying to do here. And again, why this snake is beneficial, it's gonna eat small rodents, other lizards, animals that you would consider vermin. Uh, and really, that's important because it stops the spread of disease throughout the ecosystem and potentially some of these animals can make us sick. So that's why venomous snakes as a whole are really important to the uh, ecosystem. All right, so that's the pygmy rattlesnake. That's snake number one that could, uh, well, kind of make you have a bad day. You know, the thing that I realize about venomous snakes is they're really quite beautiful. And this animal right here, this is the copperhead. And uh, this snake is actually found in northern Florida. You won't find it this far south naturally. Right. But, you know, talk to me a little bit about uh, this animal's venom. This is also... This is, we're going up in toxicity, aren't we? Well, it, kind of. You know, it's really hard because everybody's body reacts differently. Fair enough. Um, and, and there's evidence that shows that, you know, geographically, the same species, you have a different makeup of, of, That's of, right. their, of their venom. So it, it's, it's, car, it's hard to have anything, you know, specific to say, but, you know, most certainly the pygmy rattlesnake is, is not nearly as dangerous as some of the other snakes that we're going to see. And I would, I would say the same thing about the copperhead. Now, in other parts of our country, copperheads are very, very common, and this is, this is a snake which bites a lot of people. The problem that we run into is that a lot of the bites occur not necessarily because they accidentally stepped on the snake, it's people saw it and were trying to catch it, trying to kill it, or we're actually handling the animal. And that's something I want to stress also, you know, David, you bring up a great point, is the easiest way to not get bit by a snake is to leave it alone. And you have to understand, you hear all these stories, and one of the snakes we're gonna see in just a little while is notorious for chasing uh, people, and that is just a falsehood. No snake has ever bitten out of offense. It's always a defensive bite. Absolutely. A snake is afraid of you. Uh, it's either surprised, or it's, as he mentioned, it's either being grabbed at by somebody. But you know what, the, the copper head, obviously, you look back at this head and you can see the coloration there, which gives it its name. And another thing that we have to look for is, you know, the old 
tail. How do you tell if a snake is venomous and it's that triangular head? Now this can be deceiving because a lot of non-venomous snakes when threatened will flatten their yep. heads out and it gives them a triangular appearance. And that's because they know too, hey look, I wanna look scary. And unfortunately, that usually results in the snake's head being removed from the rest of its body, which in my opinion is a cowardly way to deal with uh, any animal. And what I think a lot of people don't realize too is that when you, when you step into that mode of trying to kill a sna snake, you're actually becoming a statistic. Because if you turn around and you walk away, yeah. let me tell you something, that snake doesn't want anything to do with you. Nothing Even with as close as we are right now, if we were to slowly move away, Kenan, we're, in, we're just completely out of harm's way. Obviously, being this close working with, with, with a snake is much more dangerous. But you notice how, you notice how the, the, the snake is, is not, really, not really wanting to come towards us. He's trying to find a way to go someplace else. And if you look, he's pointing between, you know, out of the way of our cameraman Tom and us, and he just wants to head into these palmettos where he can finish out his day nice and safe. So, awesome animal. One other thing that I want to comment, because one of the things that people often do is, is they think of colors, and we think of a, a copper head, mm -hmm. okay? Um, many times people take a look at a coppery color. So any snake that has red on it, they automatically assume is going to be a copper head. And, and one of the calls that I get most frequently is people who find red rat snakes or corn snakes, yeah. and they think that it's a copperhead because of that reddish color. And it couldn't be further from, from, from the truth. And in, in my mind, there really is no similarity in appearance at all. Not at all. So, snake number two, copperhead, northern Florida. David, actually, you know, every time I come over and hang out with you and help with the, the snakes, this is one of my favorite snakes to look at. This is the canebrake rattlesnake, and I think it's one of the more beautiful rattlesnakes that we have in the United States. It is, and, and let me tell you something, the, 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 the color variety is incredible. Mm -hmm. Some can actually be just absolutely pink in comparison to a darker color one like this. This is really a beautiful snake. Now, another little factoid for you folks is this is actually a color variation of the timber rattlesnake. So this, the timber and the cane break are actually synonymous. They're the same type of snake, but the southern variety, which only occurs in extreme northern Florida, is actually uh, the cane break, and then up in the northern parts of the range, it's the timber rattlesnake. Right. And they, and the two look absolutely, yeah. totally different totally from different. one another. Yep. So it's amazing the fact that they're that they're so closely related. Yeah. Now uh, we're talking about toxicity and you know level of danger. This is definitely a dangerous snake for human beings. This snake could put a hurt on it. Absolutely, for, for a few reasons. One, because of the size um, and the volume of venom that it can, it, it can deliver. But so far with the snakes that we've looked at, the toxic properties of their venom are more of a hematoxic type mm -hmm. of a venom. This particular snake, though, there's some evidence that shows that it also contains some neurotoxic properties as, as well. And you know that in itself makes this snake very, very hard to treat, and it makes it quite dangerous, and especially when you end up running into one of this size. Okay, so hematoxins are gonna affect you know, blood cells, they're gonna burst blood cells, destroy tissue. Now the neurotoxins, they're gonna stop your nerves being able to talk to the rest of your body. In other words, they clog the synapses between your nerves, and you can't send signals to breathe. So you can effectively become paralyzed, your diaphragm can become paralyzed, and you can, uh, well, asphyxiate uh, as part of the way of expiring when getting bit by this snake. Now, another thing you mentioned, and I think it's, it's something important that we need to say, uh, you know, we are talking about the venomous snakes of Florida here, but there's also some wives' tales with snakes that we, we should dispel. And you were talking about the volume of venom now. A lot of people think that a baby snake, a baby venomous snake, like a baby timber rattlesnake, is more dangerous than an adult, and that's not true. They, they don't control the amount of venom. That's just an old wives' tale they, that you get bit by a baby snake and it injects way more venom because it hasn't learned yet how much to inject, and that's just not true. Don't get bit by any snake that's venomous, a baby or adult. You know, I will say this over and over again. The smartest thing to do if you ever find yourself close to a snake, regardless of whether you know that it's venomous or not, right. stop, slowly take a few steps backwards, and leave it alone. And you know, part of the reason I want to do this video is to remind folks to come down from up north. You are in snake country, so you really have to be aware of what you're doing. You know, it's not Long Island, New York, it's not New Jersey anymore. You know, you're in a place that historically 
was a swamp and this is where these animals live. Not necessarily the cane brake, they're more pine wood snake, but you are in snake habitat. So always have that in the back of your head. Don't walk around terrified. You still have nice beaches and stuff, but be careful. We were talking before we started filming yeah. today and somebody had asked the question, what's the easiest way to tell the difference between a venomous and a non-venomous snake? And we got into the discussion about the pupils, mm -hmm. that the pit vipers that are found here in, in Florida have an elliptical pupil, right. where um, the non-venomous snakes have a round pupil. But I always tell people, you have to get too close to the snake to really tell. And depending upon the light conditions, a pit viper can still have a round pupil instead of an elliptical pupil. So we've, we've discussed the triangular head isn't necessarily a, right. a, a, a good thing to go by and neither is the elliptical pupil. For one, you gotta get too close, and two, lighting can confuse it. Definitely, and one more thing here. We're talking about a rattlesnake. This guy's rattles aren't necessarily too formed right now. He had some injury in the past, and that's why he doesn't have so many rattles. So, normally a rattlesnake is gonna be rattling. But let's get to the next animal and get him back in his enclosure. Okay, so this snake right here is probably the most famous snake, and it gets the worst rap out of any venomous snake in the southern United Snakes, uh, United Snakes. You, you like that little slip <laughs> I did? <laughs> the United Snakes of America. But here we are with the cottonmouth. Now, old timers will tell you stories about cottonmouths chasing you out of the boat, and the reality is this. This snake, like all other venomous snakes, is defensive and just wants to get away and be left alone from people. That being said, getting hit by this snake would be bad. Uh, definitely the bite of a snake from, uh, the bite from a snake like this would not be a good thing. No way. Uh, most of my experience when I run into these snakes is either they want to get out of your way as quickly as possible, or occasionally what I'll see them do is they'll curl up into a tight little circle, they'll put their head straight up, and they'll actually twitch their head back and forth, opening up their mouth, which is kind of where we got that name cotton mouth from because it displays the light color of the inside of its mouth. And I have to say, I've been out in the woods and I've been walking around not paying attention and I actually came up to a cypress knee where one of these snakes was coiled up and good thing for that white mouth because honestly, the snake did not, I was within feet, like two feet from this uh, type of snake and it opened its mouth and it, it let me know, hey, wait a minute, I gotta back up. And that's all the snake did, you know, so again. I, I, I describe it as, as a, a white flag of truce. Yes. Letting you know, I'm here, I'm not gonna go anywhere, you got everywhere to walk around. Here. Right, and this animal here lives in and around water, that's where you're gonna find them. They're highly aquatic, they'll eat fish, rodents, different lizards, basically any animal that they can find and subdue and swallow. Now you gotta also remember that a snake's venom is actually designed to help it catch and digest food. It's a modified saliva. So basically, you know, us being terrified of snakes coming after us, us, it doesn't make any sense because we're not food to them. All we are are these giant, loud, lumbering creatures that annoy them and they'd rather just go hide somewhere nice and quiet. So there is an adult cottonmouth. Sorry, I just get a little transfixed by the snake. It's that <laughs> snake hypnotism. Well, this, this is starting to exhibit the complete adult colors. Gotcha. As it gets older, it's the, the, the body is going to get darker and darker and it's going to lose the patterns. But here's what's amazing is that when you look at a baby cottonmouth, it almost looks more like a copperhead. And if we can, put this snake away, and I just want to oh, show you to what a baby looks like, because it almost looks like you're looking at a completely different species of snake. Cool, let's check it out. So, you know, David, you're talking about how the cottonmouth and the copperhead are, are kind of, they look alike, and in fact, they're actually members of the same genus. Right, they're, they're, they're very closely related to one another. Um, the cottonmouth, as it gets older, it becomes much, much darker. The, the copperheads pretty much keep the color the, the, the same all, all their entire life. But with the cottonmouths, the younger ones, to me, look more like copperheads, and they it's do. an easy mistake. Not only that, but these guys, they, they have a few adaptations. One, they have a very light color tip on their tail. Yeah, and here's the neat thing, notice how he's shaking his tail. All snakes, regardless of whether they are a rattlesnake or not, all snakes will shake or vibrate their tail. If they're sitting in leaves, it sounds like a rattlesnake. And again, it's, an, it's a scare tactic, leave me alone. But this guy has a brightly colored tail, and they've been known to use it as a lure to get something close to them, a lizard or a frog, 
so that it's within striking distance and they can grab a hold of it. And also, let's not forget that this is a Keistrodon piscivorius, which means fish eater. So that lure would come in handy, man. But let's move on to uh, probably the biggest, well, the biggest venomous snake in the United States, which just happens to live in Florida as well. Right. <laughs> you know, I've been chasing snakes my whole life, as have you, 40 years. He's a little bit older than me. But anyhow, uh, nothing will ever stop me from getting this primal sense of adrenaline when you hear the rattlesnake make that famous noise. So this is the Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake. And this is actually a smaller, uh, we pulled out a smaller one. Now he's got a bigger one, but you can see where we are. And uh, we just thought it would be a bad idea to have a large snake that can dart off into these palmettos. But you know, David, you know, you've lived in Florida your whole life. How often do you come across uh, wild diamondbacks? You know, here's the funny thing. I grew up in Miami and in my younger years would go out looking for diamondback rattlesnakes. Would rarely find a rattlesnake in the Everglades. Now I live in, uh, in Palm Beach County. And would you believe that I get a call almost once a week wow. about these snakes? Yeah. And where are they found? They're found right in the middle of the city because we've got some newer developments here that were just prime rattlesnake habitat. And now people have built houses on them and these guys are everywhere. They are everywhere. You know, it's a uh, quick funny story, guys. Back in 2008, I was in Australia looking for snakes. I call my 80-year-old dad from Brooklyn, ask him what was going on. And he had left the French doors open and in came a five-foot Eastern Diamondback. So here I am coming up empty with snakes in Australia. And my dad found the snake that I had always wanted to find. And it took me years, personally. It took me about eight years before I saw one uh, in my neighbor's yard or in the wild. You know, And it's so true what you say. These animals' habitats are being shrunk. And so that's where you get this snake-human conflict. And it's just starting to calm down right now. But now this is probably, uh, arguably, the worst bite that you're going to get from, from a venomous snake in North America. What would you say? When you look at all the different species of snakes, this is definitely not the most dangerous venom. Okay. But because of the volume of venom that it can deliver in a single bite and the size of this snake um, and the size of the fangs, when this snake makes contact, almost always there's going to be a large volume of venom that's in there. And that probably makes this snake the most dangerous snake in North America when it comes to our venomous snakes. But here's the thing. Well, notice how this snake is constantly rattling, constantly letting you know where it is because this snake doesn't want you to step on it. And it's giving you every opportunity to turn around and walk away. And again, I mentioned, uh, you know, when we pulled the snake out, that sound should be primal. Every human being hears this sound and they know to back away. And, and this snake means business. But again, you know, we like to demonize snakes, whether it be, you know, from religious reasons or just the fact that there's some kind of fear that human beings have built into them. When we wandered out of, you know, the savannas of Africa, you know, when we didn't have anti-venom. But these are not horrible animals. These are actually magnificent, highly evolved animals. I mean, get, get this. They're related to lizards, okay? Snakes and lizards are closely related. Snakes went in one direction without legs and they get around just amazingly. We haven't also discussed that most of the animals we saw today, in fact, every venomous snake we've seen so far was a pit viper. That means they have the heat-seeking pits in between their eyes and nostrils to help them locate prey. Think of them like the alien predator. You remember Arnold Schwarzenegger, 1986? Awesome movie. These guys have a heat vision, man. And that's how they can find, locate their prey. They give it a nice delivery system with those that venomous bite. Then they go back and find the animal afterwards. We have one more snake we're gonna see, but I wouldn't mind just gazing at this one for just a split second longer. So enjoy a few shots while we get the next snake ready. Okay, so we've gone from the vipers, which comes from the Latin name to give birth live, live bearing, to the final venomous snake here in Florida, and that is the beautiful coral snake. And uh, interestingly enough, David didn't have a coral snake at the sanctuary. It was the one snake we needed. And I was walking around uh, two days ago in my backyard and found this animal. So it's just magic that we got this. It was very uh, fortuitous for this video. But okay, this is definitely a venomous snake. It's related to the, to the cobra. It's an right. elapid. Uh, how often do you get calls on these? This is probably the snake that we receive the most calls about. 
uh, people are surprised to find out that this is very, very commonly found in people's backyards. Uh, they can easily bury themselves under almost any substrate, grass, the leaves, mulch, anything like that, and, and, and disappear just as quickly as, the, as they appear. So I always tell people, you know, just because you see a snake like a coral snake in your backyard, really nothing to panic about. Unlike all the other snakes that we've seen today, the coral snake really doesn't have a striking response. So you're not likely to get bitten by a snake because you step near it. You almost really have to pick up the coral snake and have your hands on it to get bitten. And that's kind of what happens here in Florida where this snake is found. Uh, either children, pets will grab it, or you'll be doing gardening, okay? And you'll disrupt the snake's you know, daytime hiding and get bitten. So again, it's a defensive bite. It's a beautiful snake. Um, but the, the venom is, you know, it is quite potent. It's a neurotoxic venom. There's a couple of different properties in it. This, this snake is very, very hard to treat for a few reasons. One, uh, the rarity at this, at this date of actual antivenom for a bite like this. Right. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies that were making it um, are no longer producing it right now. So if you get bitten by a coral snake like this, uh, there's a very, very small supply. Much of that supply probably is even outdated and is going to be off-label use, or you're going to end up with a different type of antivenom that's, that's designed for a, a snake not found in this area. Gotcha. Well, you know what, folks? We have seen six of Florida's venomous snakes. I love living down here. It's a great place to live. Even better place to vacation. No, even better place to live. Because I live where you vacation, <laughs> and we got snakes. So I want to say thanks to David. If you guys are online, go to bushwildlife.org. You're always welcome to send a donation in so he can continue doing the fantastic work that he does here and educating the public. Also, you can visit me at Camp Kennan on Instagram and Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe so you can see some more fantastic videos like this. All right, man. Get to work. I know you got meetings to do. This is more fun though, isn't it? Anything I can do to get up the office is great. Yeah. I'd rather play with snakes. Exactly. When you look at the face of the cottonmouth, you can just see this animal is not to be trifled with, you know? I mean, look at that scale right above its eyes. And there you go. Don't, don't move. Don't move. There we go. All right. So that is a you see that? You see the tongue. You see the tongue. You, tongue. you can see just how extremely fast these snakes go from zero to 60, okay?